Well, thanks for inviting me. It's really exciting to come here to Albuquerque and participate in this. I like the idea of pop-up spaces and what you're doing with this. Um, so let me just explain what you're looking at here. These are photographs from this project, There It Is, Take It, which is a audio tour project that um, highlights the history, the 100-year history of the Los Angeles Aqueduct and the Owens Valley. And uh, the Owens Valley is actually this uh, region in um, the Eastern Sierra. It's one of the first basin and ranges where the watershed is, contributes the water historically to Los Angeles, which is 233 miles away. Um, this aqueduct was built in 1913. Um, it was a very uh, contentious history of acquiring the water. I'm sure some of you have seen Chinatown, the film from 1974, Roman Polanski. Uh, great film. Um, I saw it when it came out with my parents. I'm sure it had some influence with me doing this project, but it's not the true story. Um, you should see it, but it's not really what has actually happened. And actually, the history, I think, is far more fascinating than um, the screenplay to Chinatown. And I'm waiting for someone to actually properly um, do that film. So uh, the way I approached this is I've been working on these audio tour projects. Um, started with this project, Invisible Five, which was a collaboration and it deals with environmental justice issues along the I-5 corridor between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And uh, I really enjoyed working with this format, this idea of getting people into the field, into a landscape, a space, and to critically um, look at that landscape, this idea of critical tourism. Um, is really important to me, experimental geography in that. And um, that was a very successful project and I wanted to continue working with this format. So I have done um, another audio tour project um, for another project called Jackrabbit Homestead that was funded by the California Council for Humanities. And I decided to apply again um, to work on this particular project because the anniversary was coming up in 2013, and I thought this is a great, um, you know, project to really illuminate this particular history, which a lot of people in California who, you know, this is the water that they drink, that they use every day, they really don't know much about this history, and I feel it's very important to understand the source of our resources, in particularly water, where, where does that come from? I wonder how many of you, do you know where your watershed is, where that water comes from your tap and that. So um, it's about an hour and a half um, long tour and there's 17 tracks. Um, the 395 which um, you travel to listen to the tour is a very scenic byway. This is an amazing part of California if you have a chance to drive through. You have this really wonderful view of the Eastern Sierra, Mount Whitney, um, you know, you can drive up towards Yosemite and that, and it's actually the most spectacular vantage point of the Eastern Sierra on that side. So I thought it was a really great place to do a tour like this because there's people going up to Mammoth to go skiing, they're fishing, they're camping, they're doing all sorts of, you know, climbing and stuff like that. And I wanted to give them sort of this mediated version of this landscape they're traveling through. So it's not located um, specifically to certain sites. It's not geotagged in that, but there are some sites along the route that you can actually stop. So I have um, points of interest that I suggest. Um, it's, it's fully downloadable um, for free on the internet. It's there it is, take it.org, or you can just go to kimstringfellow.com and link over to it. Um, it's also available as a mobile tour too on SoundCloud, so you can listen to the tracks there. But ideally, I hope people can actually travel and actually listen to the tour while they're traveling this particular landscape. So I'm gonna play a couple tracks here. And before I start, I'll just, Harry Williams, um, he's um, part of the Bishop Paiute tribe. He's one of the speakers in the tour and he's an environmental activist and educator, um, really great man. 
Um, this is actually the Owens River just before it enters the intake, which is you know, the concrete channel of the aqueduct, which goes down to Los Angeles. So this is sort of what the river looks like. Um, it's been recently, um, in the last 10 years, rewatered. Okay, so the, the channel was dry for um, nearly 100 years after they began this aqueduct in 1913 and it dried out. So this is sort of what it looks like and they're rewatering it. So water that would normally go to Los Angeles is now going for these environmental purposes and that. And one of these environmental purposes is where the terminus of Owens River was, which was Owens Lake, which was a dry lake. And um, before the DWP started rewatering it, um, it was considered the worst um, particulate PM10 um, pollution in the nation. So this is very small particulate that lodges in your lungs, causes all kinds of respiratory problems. And um, it became a really big issue because there's a lot of military. China Lake is out in that area. Um, visibility from the lake would completely go up. You could not see anything. And um, the military was really one of the catalysts for um, forcing LA to actually take care of this problem. So right now what they're doing is they're rewatering, they're doing all sorts of different remediation, gravel, using um, different vegetation, things like that. But the water that they're putting on the dry lake is the same amount that the city of San Francisco uses annually. So you can see there's problems there. We're in a drought right now. <laughs> and so this is, um, this is a, a history that's, far from over, you know, what's going to happen. So um, this gives you some idea of sort of loss of vegetation, some historical documents. Um, this is actually a letter to Harry from, um, he takes classes that come out. These were students from Los Angeles and sort of a response to when he talked about um, his homeland and what had been happening. More um, historic photos, photos, a couple speakers here, two ranchers. Stan Matlick, who unfortunately passed last year, and Darius Moxley. Um, and this is um, a occupation this, uh, of the Alabama Gates. It was a big event where um, when people were really fed up with what was happening, they actually took over the aqueduct um, by force. And um, it was peaceful, though. And they took the entire flow of the aqueduct and they rewatered the Owens River Channel for three days until they got um, people to start discussion and dialogue. So it's what I think is the first Occupy um, in California, and we want to restage it at some point. So, um, so I'm going to play a, a, some of the beginning tracks for you. Um, this is an hour and a half, so we can just really listen to a couple things, but just to give you sort of a taste of what this thing is about. So. Approaching Los Angeles through the desert lands of Southern California, travelers of today seldom realize that only a few generations ago, men in covered wagons laid trails through this desert region. Nearing the western edge of the continent, the motorist encounters high mountain ranges, and shortly thereafter finds through a path where snow-capped feet rise 10,000 feet on either side. The desert is left behind, and there is revealed a land of Wildering beauty and breathtaking scenery. Where giant sword leaf palms form silhouettes against bright blue heaven. Where mountain wind valleys, once thought worthless, have been transformed into a green land by courageous pioneers who have developed some of the most highly productive orchards, vineyards, and branches in America. With this story of aqueduct and water in Nevada. It's an interesting dialogue that's, that's gone on even prior to the occupation of Los Angeles Department of Water Power here in the valley, where my people have been here. They, they recognize that this was a special place and a place where, where water didn't necessarily come from the sky down to the ground, but even in other areas where there's a lot of rainfall, but it did have a vast 
water resource in that the Sierra Nevada mountains held on to it, the runoff came down, and my people were able to use that water for, for their benefit. My name is uh, Alan Bayhawk, I'm from the Big Pine Tribe, I'm a tribal member here. I am employed as the water quality coordinator for the tribe. Our people saw a need to, to utilize the valley, to utilize the water in the best way possible, and so they began to create ditches and canals and actually irrigate lands, and that really was special for this place. And then in the, well, the 1860s, other settlers from other areas started coming in and, and looking at areas and saying, we, we kind of like this area, we, we see the potential in the valley for ranching and other things, and so they began digging up things. And what was once an open land uh, became a very closed land with a lot of fences put up and property all of a sudden became owned by people as opposed to used by everyone. And that really changed the whole valley, at least from my ancestors' perspective, because there was no ownership of land, there was no ownership of water. We just were able to use it, and we used it 100%. Now, as people came in to the valley, they looked and they didn't see the fences, they didn't see ownership, and so they thought that nothing was being used to its full potential. And yet, the whole place was used. And when others came in, there became a struggle because the canals began to be used for delivering water for ranching purposes. So the, the native purposes began to dwindle. And I believe that was really the first start of water being, in a sense, stolen. Uh, later on, we see the city of Los Angeles come, and they, they looked and they saw the same thing that the ranchers saw, a place with the abundance of water that they could be able to use for their own purposes in the growing hamlet of, of Los Angeles. They then started the process of taking water from ranchers. It's always been the case in this valley that water is, is being used by one party and then another party comes in and then another party comes in. The difference with Los Angeles compared to the ranchers was all of a sudden the water was leaving. What happened with the uh, city of Los Angeles being born right here, there were worse than just the games, uh, they were the biggest water on the earth, and uh, generally it's been the biggest water. I don't say that about the personal men here, but in the early days, what they did in this valley, the infestation, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, manipulation, uh, it's inconceivable. Well, I think it's important for people in the West because we worry about water more than people in other places. But I think it's an enduring symbol as well for people no matter where you live, because we're very argumentative in this country and we, we sort ourselves out on the basis of who we like and who we don't like. And the Owens Valley story has something for everyone. Uh, who do you dislike? Big government, rich people, media, environmentalists, people who don't like environmentalists, all of these are part of the story and all of them have, are, are related to issues that are really fundamental to the way we organize ourselves as a society. And no matter which side you take on those issues, there's something substantive for you to look at you on. My name is Bill Carl. I'm the editor of the California Water Atlas and I wrote a book called Water and Power, which traces the history of the conflict in the Owens Valley and the development of the Southern California, particularly Los Angeles's water system. My name is Stan Matney. I was born and raised here in Bishop. Grandfather came here and homesteaded in 1879, 320 acres, which we were on right now part of it. It was a large cattle ranch, sheep ranch, one that is, in his day, and then he had a creamery. It was one of the better ranches in the valley in those days. My father was raised, born in 1884, on the ranch up here, along with four other brothers and one sister. It was 90 acres that my father inherited from the original ranch. He was married in 1913 and 
I am going to tell you in 1958. My folks said they wake up in the middle of the night and hear a big boom. They had a well going on. Now they didn't. They didn't. Oh, yeah, we got a night in the middle. So I came along in 1931, after 19 years of their marriage, a uh, lonely child. And I've been raised right here on the properties ever since. My dad was nearly forced to sell the PWP back in, I think, around 1929 when they were buying that property, seeking wells in the next property, and then draining the water out underneath the next one, and transporting it south. He thought he was going to be forced to sell, he came very close. Anyway, he came in one day from air duty. He was a local representative from the Michigan area here in the real estate agent down to Los Angeles. He was waiting for him. And he came in and he said, well, you know what we're here for? We want to buy the property. My dad told him, he said, well, you know what my price is for the 90 acres? How do you got to remember this in 1929? He says, my price is $50,000. And the real estate agent came in the and said, well, I'm sorry, that's the best we can do. 47 five. And dad said, well, there's no use wasting your time my time. And walked off and left him sitting there in the room. Too long after that, they got the judgment down from the courts, and they could call the hillside decree to stop the pumping on the Bishop Cone. It's still in effect today. Never one inch of the original 320 acres of the homestead has ever got into DWP hands. It's still all private property of some, some sort of money. Well, I was married in 1955. My wife and I, we the place here until 1962. And then we leased the property down out for a big mobile home park here. It was at this time that they were building the second aqueduct. They kept that very quiet, but the second aqueduct was put in. There was never much, most people didn't really realize what was going on. And I've been very opposed to that water treatment, as, as you probably heard. And the man of Chessman always uses my favorite quote. Is, is that the water agreement wasn't worth the paper it was written on, and I still, I still study that today. Um, so how, how does the tour work, and how to get the word out about something like this? Is that what you're... Yeah, I think it covers a, a vast area of land, in my experience, and the audience members are concentrated. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something um, I'm yet to do a walking, a hike. I really want to do something that is pedestrian. But it seems like this made more sense because it's this area where a lot of people are, like I said, they're vacationing and they're traveling from Los Angeles actually to go into this landscape. What is interesting about um, Owens Valley, that the valley floor is owned by the city of Los Angeles. So you can see you know, and the sign here, um, it's almost like a water colony up there. So they own the valley floor. They leave it open for recreation, fishing, camping. Some places you're not supposed to be camping, but um, it's pretty much open in that. So there's a lot of people traveling through it, and they're also going up to Mammoth. They're going the back way up to Yosemite or Tuolumne. So I figured this was a good way to get people who are using this water and you know, obviously interested in the environment and that because they're traveling up here to recreate um, a place to get them to sort of think about where their water's coming from. So what I did is um, I did postcards. I worked with local businesses and local media. Um, we did a listening party in that, and we actually, uh, you know, put cards, posters throughout 395. So it's it's one road that goes through the valley. So there's just, you know, very quaint small towns with businesses on either side. There's not really any, there's no sprawl whatsoever. So you can really sort of target people there. 
And then the website is, um, you know, I use social media and things like that, and also through getting, say, editorial features. There's a UC Press. Um, they did a whole aqueduct issue last year, so it was presented in that. But it does take time to get these the word out, you know, and a lot of times it takes... Um, you know, after a few years, like my Jackrabbit Homestead project, I'm getting a lot of interest in that, although it was done in 2009, because it takes time for people to sort of, like, pass the word about these things. But that is always sort of the issue with how to distribute, disseminate the content. Um, can you maybe talk more about Bill Carl and his book, uh, Water and Power? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great quote, right? Yeah. And so I'm interested in kind of how you disseminate some of the stuff kind of through that. Yeah, well, that was one of the main texts that I used for research um, for the project. And, you know, it turned out you heard him just in the very beginning after Alan Baycock spoke. That's Bill Carl. And he's an amazing person to just hear speak because he's, you know, he's wonderful. And, um, you know, his perspective is really slanted towards you know what had happened to Owens Valley and this idea of not letting this type of thing happen to other places such as eastern Nevada you know there's also this controversy you may know about um, water you know there's a similar sort of area that the city is really trying to buy up water rights and do another Owens Valley in that particular area so um, I guess I sort of forgot what your, your question well, was, but... Uh, how would you speak to the impact of his book in terms of kind of furthering the public discourse on something like this? Um, I wish more people knew about it, to tell you the truth. You know, I think, I think that um, what's unfortunate is more people know about the film Chinatown and think that is the actual history than they know about Bill Carl's book. Okay, so... And, you know, a lot of people know about Cadillac Desert, which is another um, great book. There's some flaws in that book. Um, it's exaggerated in certain instances, but it's wonderful ne nevertheless. So, um, yeah, I think it's important. Uh, that was done in 1980, Bill Carl's book and that. You know, he's still very um, involved in water politics in California. You know, he works with... Jerry Brown on all sorts of things. He's basically sort of a water lobbyist in that. So um, I'd like to, you know, hear more from him in that. You know, he did the Water Atlas and that. So, so I don't know if that really answered yeah, your question, but yeah, yeah. But it's great. I'm I'm glad that you're well aware because it's a it's a fantastic book. So. It's a very contentious subject there, and you know, there's activists and people that, um, you know, people really support, like Bennett Kessler, who runs Sierra Wave uh, News Media out there. It's the local media, and she's been um, fighting since the 1970s, and, and you know, always all sorts of newscasts that deal with anything that dealing with the aqueduct. Everyone there is very supportive of the people that work there. You have to understand they employ most, the majority of the people in the valley, LADWP. So, you know, there's, these are neighbors and friends and that, that work here. And it's also that I don't think anyone who spoke necessarily wants them to leave because one of the outcomes, you know, from this is the fact that it has retained open space. You know, what would the valley be if, you know, Los Angeles didn't occupy it, did not use the watershed? So there's, there's definitely some positive outcomes from that. I see that as something positive. But at the same time, you know, if they were left to their devices, 
would they have just completely drained, which they were doing in the 1970s and 80s. They, they started a very aggressive groundwater pumping policy that if they had been left on their own, would have completely created a desert there. Okay, so, um, you know, those are things that are really important. I think it's really important for, you know, the public to be the watchdog. Um, the last track sort of deals with that with local sort of, you know, talking about if we want to make CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, really work, we have to be vigilant into actually being the watchdogs for this. And the Owens Valley Committee, these groups, have been the ones that are the catalyst for this. But, you know, of course there's dissenters in that. I worked with, you know, DWP. I worked with people, they're speakers in here. And you can hear in some of the voices, like Brian Tailmans, who's the biologist, who's working on the LORP, which is the lower Owens Valley River restoration or remediation. And, um, you know, he talks about, yeah, some people, you know, we're not doing criticizing and, and this and that, but yet, you know, I live here too, and this is my backyard, and, you know, I want the best for this too. So there was, you know, with some of the more radical speakers, I think some people, but for the most part, I think the people up there were very supportive. And I've even talked with board, um, you know, water commissioners, Jonathan Parfrey, I interviewed, he didn't end up in the mix in this particular tour, but, um, you know, there's been a change, you know, on certain levels, not on others, because right now with the Owens Dry Lake, um, there is still a lot of litigation that's happening. LA wants to stop the amount of water, the amount of remediation they're doing there, and they're being sued by the, um, it's a federal entity that deals with air pollution there. So this is ongoing type of thing. But for the most part, I think the people there, um, when I first did it, I thought it was gonna have LA people and, but it really became about Owens Valley and the impacts in Owens Valley. Um, let me do the title first. There it is, take it, is what William Mulholland, who was the head of um, the DWP at the time, you know, he, when this event happened in 1913 in November, he turned to the mayor and basically, he didn't say this to the public, but they had this big celebration and they let the water finally come down the gates, you know, you can see all the people lined up, and he turned to the mayor and he said, Mr. Mayor, there it is, take it. And it was re recorded. So I thought, you know, that says it all. You know, it was really, if, if you listen to the track that I started just after Alan Baycock with Bill Carl um, starting that track, he goes into that history and then he will sort of tell you what has happened there. Um, so that's, that's where the title comes from. And I wanted it to be provocative. You know, I really wanted this to be like, uh, grab you somehow and, and that. Um, Production-wise, my, my work is really research-driven, so I have to spend a lot of time really delving into the project before I actually start to figure out the form it's going to take. This one was a little bit different because I knew I was going to do an audio tour because I already knew I had this route, you know, this wonderful route to work with. So I, I knew eventually it was going to be that. And um, started sort of initially, but it takes me about a year, year and a half of just research to really sort of understand all the different stakeholders and issues and things because I want to be pretty knowledgeable 
you know, a, about that um, subject before I really start to, you know, a lot of reading and, and that too, so. Production, um, so I do, um, it, audio is great because it's a pretty easy learning curve, you know, for most people to do editing in that. So I do the initial storyline, like I build, because it's sort of in my head with what the story is through the research. And so I do the basic editing of the voices. And I, of course, I'm a one-person production team, so I'm contacting people. I have to be out in the field. A lot of this was hard to do because, you know, people are a little weary of outsiders. It's very rural up there. And, you know, I met Stan through Harry, actually, um, you know, said, hey, I, I want to introduce you to this gentleman. But it took me some time when I got up there just to be able to get people to trust me, which a journalist can't do in, you know, two weeks, three weeks. So that makes a big difference that I'm able to spend time in the community and really get to know them and earn their trust um, for, for a particular project. So um, I start to build the storylines and then I sort of let it form itself. But Tim Halber, who was the audio, um, he did the, the soundscape and production. He worked on Invisible Five. Um, we work together on this project. So I had sort of ideas and structures, and we have, you know, music and things we work with and sound effects. And then I also, he just goes and he does his thing. So um, it's a collaboration as well. Um, but the website, you know, I'm sort of a jack of all trades. I do the website and build all that, and I'm a photographer as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of photography. So it's pretty time consuming to do something. I, I need to start working possibly with some other people on some of these projects to, you know, so. Well, thanks, Tim. You're great. welcome. No, we can't. It may be hard to sort of listen. I'll play Harry's, because Harry's is really good.